Welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam show, a broadcast here from the international headquarters of Nissan Communications in beautiful Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, this is our mission of this show is to tell the real story of the, of the American war in Vietnam and the men and women who served. We try to dispel some of the myths and misunderstandings and downright uh, uh, fabrications that have come out about the war. And one of the things we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to cover a lot of that. Uh, my name is Bill Dixon. I was a Vietnam veteran in 1967-68. I'm a Tet survivor. I was at Long Bend, uh, 22 miles north of Saigon. And uh, if you want to see the uh, archives, uh, tonight's show, I've got a lot of material to cover. I'm going to be going fast. But if you want to go back and and see it at, uh, on demand at any time or some of your friends who wouldn't, couldn't tune in tonight, uh, on demand is NCV vi.org TV show, and then click on archives or on demand. I think it says on demand instead of archives, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, to be part of the show during, during the uh, night tonight, our, our presentation, uh, or make comments or whatever it is you want to uh, say, do, whatever, uh, just dial 919 518 9773, or even better, uh, go on to Skype at Computers 2K Voice. And that way you don't have to worry about any long distance charges or whatever. And uh, tonight's show is uh, Vietnam Veterans and uh, the uh, document, doc, documentary. My mouth's not working there. They're, they're speaking of the Ken Burns, uh, Lynn Nowak uh, documentary. Uh, my concern on, in doing this show was that it was entertaining uh, to a certain extent. It was uh, colorful. Uh, worked on uh, a lot of truths, but it also had grains of uh, a little bit missed it there. And I'm concerned that this is going to be used as a definitive answer uh, in studying the Vietnam War, and that it is not. Uh, there's a lot of scholars out there who are taking issue with the, um, with the uh, documentary. I don't understand uh, how they could have put in what they got a lot of good information in there. They could have probably done it instead of 10 hours, made it in 20 hours, and still not had it all in. But before we get started, I just wanted to know, uh, let you know that uh, you veterans out there, if you know someone out there and uh, you're having some problems, 1-800-273-8255 uh, and press 1. There's somebody standing by uh, to help you out there. Okay. Uh, Vietnam Veterans and the Burns and Novick doc documentary, that's their cover they used, uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, I was going to have tonight R.J. Uh, Del Vecchio, we, just, we called him Del, but something came up at the last minute, so he had to go out of town. But we'll be, I can tell you now, this is not going to be a one-part show, it's going to be a two-part show. Uh, there's just too much information out there to cover in one. And he is supposed to be back on uh, with us when we meet again on November the 8th, when we get back on the show. Uh, Dale is very involved with the Vietnamese American community and has returned to Vietnam on numerous occasions to give aid to the forgotten people of Vietnam, uh, the former South Vietnamese soldiers. Some of you may remember when Dale was on last time when he was in Saigon and was invited to the chief of police uh, office and kind of told to get the hell out of Dodge or Saigon and uh, from trying to help the uh, former Arvins and so forth. But uh, looking forward to uh, Dale uh, being back with us uh, the next show. And some of the, he has helped me with some of the information we have as far as uh, different uh, people. What I've done is I've got some quotes from uh, some Vietnam veterans who saw, who saw the documentary. I've got people who uh, I would say are experts on, on Vietnam and the Vietnam War, which I am not. I am very interested in it and done a lot of studying, but I'm not an expert. But I've got a lot of experts who put their two cents in tonight, and I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, let me kind of give you a little bit of background here. Uh, the United States of America was involved in Vietnam for a total of 19 and a half years. Uh, Ten years of it, of course, we were uh, more of a combat or advisor role. Over the 10 years, the U.S. Uh, role changed many times. It went from uh, advisors to uh, combat to victimization to advisors again. Uh, the normal tour of duty was from 12 to 13 months, so most soldiers spent anywhere from 12 to 13 months. 
Uh, one of the problems we had was a lot of the lieutenants who were uh, leaders out in the field, after six months, they were transferred back to uh, a base camp or something for administrative work, and another lieutenant would go out there. And just about the time he uh, got ready to uh, know what he was doing, he was transferred back to the other thing, too. Uh, Vietnam is a long and narrow country with a wide, wide variety of land types. Uh, it goes from swamp swamps, I mean swampy swamps, to just plain old water, uh, right on up into the central highlands uh, with the mountains and area and so forth. Uh, it has very diverse groups, uh, people living there. Uh, the temperature and the terrain is pretty much tropical, uh, warm and warmer, uh, monsoons and so forth. So it's very varied. It's Even though it's a small country, it's very varied in its uh, uh, peoples, uh, weather, uh, technical areas, and so forth. So as we go through, uh, next slide. Uh, it's it's hard to get a consensus because um, most uh, most veterans, the daily effort to survive was paramount. My wife told me if I got killed in Vietnam, she'd kill me. So like most veterans, my job was to survive uh, on, to the next day and come home. Uh, most veterans were not political towards the war or, or since it's not a war, it was a conflict. Uh, I think anytime people are shooting at you, though, it's a war. Uh, most veterans were not involved in the overall context of the war. In other words, on a day-to-day -day basis, all I knew was where I was standing and what I was doing and what I was going to be doing. Uh, who was who planned on what and what what campaign this was and uh, and so forth. We didn't have a whole lot to do with. We just went where we were told and did what we were told to do to the best of our knowledge. As it says there, most veterans only knew what was happening that day, that day and where they stood. Um, they didn't. They didn't bother to send me or any other people I knew of to the briefings to tell us what the what they had in mind. So, the veteran depended on the year in Vietnam of the ten plus years. Their branch of service, whether it's Army, Marines, Navy, Air Force, Merchant Marines, or Coast Guard, their military rank, the unit they were assigned to, the location of that unit in Vietnam, and their particular job in that unit. Each veteran has a different experience and a different story. So basically, you could say, in a lot of times, we had one years of experience 10 plus times. Uh, we did it over and over again, and you know, by the time you learned something, it was ready to come home, uh, and a few people extended and so forth. But So basically, what I'm trying to get across to you out there is, how do you get a consensus of the Vietnam War? 10 years, each soldier, on average, spent one year there and that one year their experience was totally different than another person who was there a different year or even at the same time if you go online to search just about any fact or misfact can be found with information to support someone's opinion there's a lot of garbage out there on the internet that you can pull up as the gospel that ain't nobody's gospel uh, the document is educational, but it does carry the opinions and beliefs and biases of its authors. When they selected what to omit from the documentary and what to include, they, were they affected by these thoughts, biases, and information they accepted as facts? Uh, I'm going to give you a quote in a little bit that uh, talks about how they couldn't put everything in. Uh, there's no way they could put everything in. Uh, there was just too much about it, but they left out some pertinent parts as far as I'm concerned. And how did they decide what was to be included and what not was to be included because they weren't there. Uh, a series in 20 parts and 50 hours most likely would not cover everything to everyone's expectations. Uh, I don't think God could have done uh, a documentary that everybody would have been happy with. Uh, so they had, they had an awesome task uh, in, in putting it together. Now, let's also, we talked about the Vietnam veterans and where they were and so forth. But at the same time, let's talk about what was going on in the country at the time. Civil rights movement. It was the first, mo first war we had ever watched on TV during dinner time. Uh, the war protesters, the space race, school, uh, school segregation, the fashion, the rock and roll, voting rights, women's rights, burning bras, all that good stuff was going on. 
So when a soldier went to Vietnam, he took all that was going on in this country with him to Vietnam. It just it just didn't flush it out of his brain. So he spent his year in Vietnam, and then he came back. And that also influenced uh, how he felt at the time and what he saw and what he did. So now to Ken Burns and Len Le Novick, the Vietnam War documentary. This lesson of Vietnam show was started to dispel the many myths and misconceptions of the American Vietnam War, as I mentioned to start with. This show host believes that the documentary was informative, but often misleads and distorts facts by its admissions and sometimes content. Now, you may have thought it was uh, the greatest thing you've seen, uh, had all the truths in it. Uh, I personally do not, and uh, I'm telling you that it's my personal opinion and a lot of other people's opinion, and I'm trying to cover everybody's opinion tonight. When I do these shows, I normally don't tell you my personal opinion one way or the other. I let you come up with your own uh, ideas and so forth and on these uh, controversial subjects. Will this documentary become the official word in history of the Vietnam War as it's used by teachers to teach, teach the uh, Vietnam War? Uh, unfortunately, I think it is going to be uh, used in more and more schools. Um, it needs to be seen as a piece of the Vietnam War puzzle, not the piece, but as part of it. And hopefully this show can be a companion piece with the documentary. I, I know I don't have the uh, clout that uh, Burns and Novak has on PBS, but it's important that uh, we get the word out. It's important that our children and our grandchildren and our other children and, and our child grandchildren's children uh, get some of the real facts. For all these 50-some years now, there's been a lot of misfacts, and we just need to get the real stories out there. And that's the reason for the show. Uh, not to criticize someone's work by hindsight. Uh, hindsight's wonderful, isn't it? But we want to add a valuable tool to use in the supplementation of this documentary. We hope to show the good as well as the questionable parts. The show includes written comments from Vietnam veterans, scholars giving their feelings and beliefs. The Vietnam War is still a controversial and passing subject to be discussed. It, it just it riles people up even today uh, who live through it. We invite you, our viewers, viewers <clears throat> and I'm already losing my voice here. We invite you, our viewers, to call in and voice your opinion and take part in the discussion. And you can do that by dialing 919-518-9773 or Skype. That's Computers 2K Voice on Skype. Now, who's going to watch such a documentary as, Bern, as Burns and Newick's uh, documentary? Well, you're going to have uh, some Vietnam vets who are boots on the ground. I've had several vets tell me that, hey, I lived it, and I live it every night now, so I don't need to watch the um, documentary, and that's fine. Uh, it's not for everybody. Uh we all live Vietnam every day. Uh, it's like the saying, when were you in Vietnam last night? Vietnam era veterans, uh, veterans who served their country, and by the luck of the draw, or whatever, didn't end up in Vietnam. I would have been, I would have been happy to have been one of those. Families of Vietnam vets were going to be watching this uh, documentary. Gold Star families. Gold Star families are the families whose loved ones or etched, names are etched on the wall in Washington, D.C., the real heroes of the Vietnam War, those who were killed uh, fighting for their country. The former South Vietnamese military, uh, we've got a large contingent uh, group here in the Triangle in Raleigh. People who grew up during that time, but maybe not involved in the war one way or the other, but grew up in that time. And then you got the draft dodgers and the war protesters uh, are, are watching the documentary to see how, how well they did in the documentary. Draft Dodgers and war protesters' families, uh, their families had part of the war where they uh, helped, helped their uh, uh, son to uh, go to Canada or, or someplace else or just burn their, stay out of their draft. Then we have academics who got the information from books, people who studied the Vietnam War extensively from things that other people have done. And then we have Vietnam veterans who have studied the war and used personal knowledge. Uh, there's a lot of Vietnam vets out there who have done, spent a great deal of time talking to other veterans, talking to South Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, who 
who have a lot of knowledge on the Vietnam War. It's amazing uh, how knowledgeable these people are on the Vietnam War. So this is the type of people we're going to be having watch it. But see, each one of them are going to see the documentary in a different way. They're going to see, again, the documentary on somewhat, I won't say their biases, but preconceived, even the, uh, the scholars and the Vietnam vets, we're all going to see it different, just like we saw the Vietnam War itself different. In a recent interview with New American Media, Novik, that was the, one, the woman who worked with Burns, acknowledged that it, historically the stories of South Vietnamese were simplified in the U.S. news media, which she said portrayed the South as inept and corrupt. Now, I've had a lot of, of Vietnam vets who tell me the same thing, but there were some uh, inept and, and corrupt uh, units out there, but there were some also very good units, and later on in the war, they proved themselves as being good units. Uh, but the film has gone a long way to tell their stories. Uh, she must have been talking about a different film than the one I saw. Um, the heroism and the stories of personal sacrifice made by those on the losing side, she said. And I must have missed that part. I ask about criticism that stories were missing from the narrative. Burns, in the same interview, said he and Novak had to make huge, painful decisions. We cannot tell every story, Burns said. Even if it were 18, 180 hours, people would say, you left this out. What you want to do is tell a story in which this gold star mother had to stand in for lots of gold star mothers, and this Saigon civilian had to stand in for many Saigon civilians, and this Arvin Army of the Republic of Vietnam Marine had to stand in for many other Arvin Marines. But we feel that we put our arms around everything, which would be very hard to do, as we said. Each person has a different uh, story to tell where they were, what year they were there, their jobs, and so forth. Now, this is an interview that uh, Phil Kay did with uh, uh, Burns and Novak, and his title of his piece was Ken Burns never knew how wrong he was about the Vietnam War. Novice Robert Stone once likened the Vietnam War to a piece of shrapnel, embedded in our definition of who we are. As a veteran of the Iraq War who has written about the experiences of returning soldiers, I jumped at the chance to speak with Burns about this most formidable project to date. Now, I'm going to go with, uh, with PK. I'm going to go Phil. And where it says KB, when we get to it, I'm going to go with Ken. Okay, Phil, you've covered two wars already. Why this one? Ken, a good deal of the problems we have today had their seeds planted in the division it would produce. I grew up in the 60s. I was eligible for the draft. My father was against the war, so I was against the war. I have a question there was, uh, Ken, were you a draft dodger or were you, uh, when you said you were eligible for the draft, does that mean that you turned 18 and had to register or just how were you eligible for the draft? But I paid attention and watched the body count. I would be so happy when there were fewer dead Americans. I thought I knew a lot about it. And so I went in with the kind of arrogance that people with superficial knowledge always have. Lynn and I have spent 10 years shedding our feeble preconceptions. It was a daily humiliation. Phil, I was struck by what journalist Neil Shannon had told you. It always galls me when I read about or hear about the World War II generation as the greatest generation. These kids were just as gallant and courageous as anybody who fought the war to World War II. Ken Burns. I think what Neil was saying is that we don't want to sentimentalize, sentimentalize war. Y'all have seen the show before. You know I have a tough time of pronouncing some words, so forgive me for that as I go. Uh, one of my many uh, uh, struggles. World War II is smothered in sentimentality and nostalgia. That's because it was a long time ago. What's interesting about Vietnam is that sentimentality is just not there. So you're given kind of a clean access to it in one way. It's also a war that represents a failure to the United, for the United States. 
many people come back feeling like they never wanted to talk about it again. And so we developed a national amnesia. It wasn't that we came back and didn't want to talk about it, folks. We came back and nobody wanted us to talk about it. We'd have been perfectly happy to discuss it, uh, but nobody wanted to discuss it with us. Phil, the war also came at a time when the racial tension in the United States were coming to a head. For instance, the way the draft functioned. PK again, Phil. Were your Vietnamese participants concerned about how they would be portrayed? Ken Burns, of course, in the exact same fashion as the Americans. But after a few questions, they realized what we were about. You see them beginning to cop to stuff. The massacre of civilians after the Tet Offensive Battle of Way has never been acknowledged by the Vietnamese government. And we've got two of their soldiers describing it as an atrocity. It's important to point out of who he was talking to there. This is uh, the conversation he had with the North Vietnamese communist, not the South Vietnamese who were our allies. Talking about the civilians massacred at, at uh, Way was the North Vietnamese communist who killed thousands and thousands of their own people during the Battle of Way. Phil, right. So how did you get out to out to to retell a story that's so often reduced to one about white college-aged men and their families grappling with going to war or not going, or coming home or protesting when the reality is so much broader. Ken Burns says, Thank you, Phil, for being the first person who has asked that. One way is to avail ourselves of the recent scholarship and begin to craft a narrative that is accurate to the real events of that war. <clears throat> Then populate the illustration of what that war was enough variety of human experiences, American and Vietnamese, that it permits you to realize that memory is not just fragile, sometimes fraudulent, manipulated, and self-serving, but also accurate. You began to realize that more than one truth can coexist. Uh, I, I think right there, Ken is speaking in uh, tongues or something. Uh, because he talks about uh, there how you couldn't get a consensus basically from any one person, but then he turned back around before that and said that he talked to a, a gold star mother who represented all gold star mothers. He he talked to a South Vietnamese soldier who represented all the South Vietnamese Marines, uh, and then he says here that you couldn't do that, and people's memory was that. Uh, but it's we'll just keep right on moving along and. Uh, Ken Burns, African Americans saw the military as a way out of poverty, a job, and a steady pay. But as the civilian rights movement reached a fever pitch, there was a disproportionate number of African Americans serving in combat roles and therefore being wounded and killed. The military, to their credit, did try to address this. But the larger thing is that the Vietnam is that Vietnam represents a kind of microcosm, microcosm, excuse me, there we go again, of America in the 60s. One needs to go no further than Muhammad Ali, his saying, no Viet Cong ever call me nigger. Now, that is not proven he said that. It is an important uh, part of the story and the way African Americans within units were segregated and made to feel inferior. Now, I did a show not too long ago, uh, The Black Experience in Vietnam, and basically, all the all of the uh, black soldiers we talked to, uh, who were combat, uh, said they saw very little. Uh, I have talked to some that did see a lot of uh, segregation and, and problems, uh, but it's almost like here we're saying that all uh, black soldiers had uh, or made to feel inferior, uh, inferior, and so forth. I know the unit that we were with uh, didn't seem to have that problem. Um, and also, uh, go back up to what he talked about. Orig initially, because so many uh, uh, black soldiers had served in the military because it was a way to do better, that initially in the war, the ratio was 20%. Uh, African Americans who were, uh, who were killed or wounded in the war. But by the time of the end of the war, the, the percentage was 11 point something percent which was right at the national uh, 
census on uh, the black Americans in America. So it adjusted itself. So by the end of the war, it was uh, the ratio was uh, balanced out to be uh, about equal to the population of the people. So uh, those are kind of things that kind of need to be brought out uh, to get the real history uh, that was just kind of skipped over there. Uh, as one black soldier says, they don't care if you're from Roxbury or South Boston, they're going to shoot you. Uh, that's talking about the enemy. Ken Burns, there's nobody sitting there like a villain in a B-movie saying, oh, good, let's go ruin this country and settle the names of the United States. There are jerks and idiots at various points. Amen. But most of them are acting in good faith. Well, okay. This was something that was began in secrecy and ended 30 years later in failure. Uh, I'm not certain where the secrecy part comes in there. Uh, other than the Gulf of Tonkin didn't really officially happen when it did. It kind of was before. That was a word we spent word we spent little a year arguing over. It wasn't a defeat. Nobody took over the United States. It was not a surrender. We failed. Okay. Phil, Vietnam was carried out under five presidents, and Iraq and Afghanistan are under a third. Did this series make you more hopeful about America's ability to wrap up these conflicts or less? Ken Burns says, our job is to just tell the story, not to put on big neon signs saying, hey, isn't this kind of like the president? Present, not the president, the present. But we know historical narratives cannot help but be informed by our own fears and desires. The taxes of Viet Cong and also the North Vietnamese Army employed as well as the Taliban and Al-Qaeda now ISIS suggests an infinite war. And that's why you hope that lessons of Vietnam can be distilled. Mark Twain is supposed to have said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. We have spent our lives listening to the rhymes. Now history makes me an optimist. When people say, this is the worst time ever, I go, uh-huh. Now Phil's talking to Lynn Novick. When you uh, were coming up in this project, I imagine you had a very different relationship with the Vietnam War than Ken did. He came of age at the war's peak. You were born in 1962. How did the war affect you and your family at the time? Lynn, the war was ongoing for my entire childhood. I remember feeling like it's just never going to end. It was a perpetual war. I don't have any family members who were directly affected by it. My parents were too old and they were too young to be in World War II. They slipped in between. I didn't pay much attention to, to be honest, as a teenager until the Hollywood movies began to start to come out in the late 70s. They certainly imprinted me with some ideas about what the war might have been like. At the same time, they were very melodramatic. I know I can get all these right. Uh, Phil, your primary memory of the war was shaped by Hollywood. Lynn, well, not completely. They were my first visual experience of it, I would say. And as a kid, we didn't have the TV on in the evening to watch the news. Yeah, the Hollywood movies and some fiction. Then I started to become extremely interested and read everything I could get my hands on from the time I was in college until we made this film. I remember the Stanley Carnoff series coming out pretty soon after I graduated from college and being really blown away by it. That opened up a lot of questions in my mind that certainly couldn't answer. Phil, what would you say are the biggest fallacies about the Vietnam War that fictional movies have perpetuated? Lynn, one blind spot in all the Hollywood movies that I remember is that the Vietnamese, if depicted at all, were completely one-dimensional. I can't think of a Hollywood film in a time that we're discussing that really gives a dimensional representation of anything to do with the Vietnamese uh, what the Vietnamese were going through on both sides. Phil, some of the interviews with Vietnamese c citizens and former soldiers in your series was just remarkable. What was it like covering them to get on the board with uh, on board with the project? Lynn, it was really the same process in Vietnam as it was here. I wouldn't differentiate uh, that much between people's reluctance or enthusiasm about doing it. A lot of just connecting with someone and doing your homework. 
knowing a lot about them and their experiences and whatever the environment that they were living in that you're interested in talking about. The people that we talked to in Vietnam were not reluctant. I guess that's the best way to say it, or they wouldn't have talked to us. They seemed extremely open to the idea. The only reason we were surprised was because we had no idea what to expect. We were surprised to find how open people were to talk about such a painful subject. Just the scale of tragedy there. How many people were killed? How small of a country it is? How everybody was affected? The real horrors of the war. If I'd gone through something like that, I'm not sure I'd be able to talk about it. Now, I can tell you, Lynn, uh, I've been back to Vietnam three times. Uh, they do uh, like to talk, but they are also very careful in what they say because it is a communist government. They still have no uh, human rights uh, there, basically. Um, so uh, even what they may have told you was pretty, pretty guarded. Uh, Phil, what are the lessons you drew from the stories of Vietnamese refugees who fled the war and its aftermath? Lynn. To go back to the fall of Saigon, I felt it's not the same bitterness that you and your colleagues feel about what has happened recently, which I'm not certain exactly what she means there. But that there was a sense that we abandoned our ally and we abandoned our people and left them at the mercy of the North Vietnamese. Yeah, that is absolutely true. We let a pretty small number of people get out right before the fall of Saigon compared to the number of people that probably wanted to leave. Uh, yeah. Uh, then we really weren't welcoming people with open arms exactly. There was no kind of concerted effort to really take responsibility for the fact that we had hired people, we had promised them things, that all being said, there are over a million and a half Vietnamese Americans living in the USA today. They are extremely patriotic and loyal and just devoted Americans, they're, they're that first generation. They often come from military families. There are people who got out of Vietnam who are grateful to be here for sure, but also left behind a lot of people. And she says here, we paid a heavy price. I can tell you folks, the South Vietnamese refugees paid an even heavier price. Phil, how do we achieve reconciliation? That's always one of my favorite words, reconciliation. Wow, that is a $64,000 question. I don't know. I'm optimistic that enough time has passed and that people can just reset and take a look at this and have a different kind of conversation. Len, I can tell you, it's not that easy to just hit a reset button. We've seen it happen. I think there's something extraordinary powerful about the process of having to hear the stories of people you don't agree with. It seems to open people up to hear each other, and all I can say is we've seen it happen again and again in the conversations after screening. There are informal focus groups of people who are bitterly opposed on many levels. After watching the entire film, they're willing to say, well, maybe I didn't understand as much as where you were coming from, and maybe I thought I was being patriotic. But at least I understand you have a valid point of view, and I uh, estimate you. And that was the interview by Phil Kay, whose writing appears in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and uh, Brookings Institute. Uh, that was a uh, uh, interview done by Phil K. Okay, now this is uh, one by a gentleman by the name of Mark Moya. Uh, comments dial nine one nine five one eight nine seven seven three or Skype to Computers Two K Voice. A warped mirror. This is his, the title of his piece. Uh, emissions and distortions mark Ken Burns' Vietnam War. A missed opportunity to provide a historically honest look at the conflict. 27 years ago, Ken Burns mesmerized American audiences with the Civil War, an 11-hour documentary that took five years to produce. 40 million Americans watched its initial airing, and many more watched reruns or read the companion book. The series rekindled popular interest in the Civil War, stimulating a flood of books and battle reenactments that continues to this day. Burns and co-director Lynn Novick spent 10 years and $30 million producing the Vietnam War, an 18-hour, 10-episode production. Anyone turning in to media coverage or attending one of the public panels featuring Burns and Novick is likely to conclude that the new documentary has equaled the Civil War in historical and artistic virtuosity. 
But if one listens to America or South Vietnamese veterans of the conflict, more easily heard today thanks to the Internet, their verdicts are less complimentary. During the months, the months long publicized blitz preceding the documentary's release, Burns and Novick well, vowed that the Vietnam War would not malign American veterans or, vet or Vietnam or blame them for the war, as happened so often in the past. Instead, the film would portray veterans as patriotic Americans who answered their call, their nation's call to duty. The documentary would support the troops without necessarily supporting the war. I've always wondered how you do that. As for the war itself, the production would not promote a particular viewpoint. Again, I must have watched a different uh, documentary. We don't have an agenda, Burns told the media. We're just umpires calling balls and strikes. So why aren't veterans as enthused about the Vietnam War as they should be? The foremost reason that Burns and Novak are not actually impartial referees, but instead use the documentary to promote an agenda in ways glaringly obvious to veterans throughout, though not readily apparent to those too young to have lived through the war. Burns and Novick wish to show the American fought a war that was unnecessary and unwinnable and that it did so out of national hubris. With the consistency of a jackhammer, the documentary highlights the events most conducive to a negative interpretation of American involvement while ignoring those supportive, more positive interpretations. interpretations. During the 1962 and 1963, for instance, the Vietnamese Communists lost nearly every battle. Yet the only battle from this period that Burns and Novak cover is the Communist victory at Atbok. Compounding the distortion, the documentary characterizes Atbok as a historical represent, representative. During 1966 and 1967, American forces inflicted hundreds of lopsided defeats on the North Vietnamese. But the six battles that Burns and Novick feature in the episode devoted to those years belong to a small minority of engagements where both the American and North Vietnamese forces suffered heavy losses. In the battles that it covers, the documentary takes little note on the heroism of American veterans aside from a fleeting reference. Nothing is said of, of the 259 Americans who won the Congressional Medal of Honor or the tens of thousands who won the other combat awards or the many more whose valor was recognized only by their comrades. As if a football team won 150 games, tied 10, lost two over seven seasons, but its video chronicle, chronicler focused only on the ties and losses. The players on that team would hardly be expected to view that videographer as their supporter, no matter how much he professed to be one, and no matter how often he claimed to have no agenda. U.S. Army and Marine Corps officers generally committed more errors in the battle where the Americans sustained the most casualties. Burns and Novak consistently emphasized these errors as evidence that mil American military leaders were inept. Mark Moyer is the director of the CSIS Project on Military and Diplomatic History. And again, this is what he has to say. John Del Vecchio, uh, who I have some more of, one of the finest novices of the Vietnam War, blasted Burns and Novick for vilifying American officers in this online rebuttal of their documentary. And I'm going to tell you how to get to that online uh, rebuttal. I wish here to openly thank leaders and commanders of the 101st Airborne Division, Air Mobile units from platoon to brigade for the leadership, which is so vastly superior to what I've been seen portrayed on Mr. Burns and Ms. Novick's uh, Del Vecchio wrote. Sure, I was blessed to soldier under such uh, officers. Surely I was blessed to soldier under such NCOs and officers. That was a quote from John that uh, Moore used. Burns and Mack restricted their own camera interviews to individuals who participated in the war, leaving out historians aside from those who were also veterans. The first-person perspectives are highly valuable, but sole reliance upon them is problematic when it comes to larger issues of military strategy and politics. As I mentioned a while ago, because we only knew what we were doing for the day, and he also mentions a while ago in his interview that 
uh, our memories are sometimes fragile. Most of the senior military and political leaders are now dead and thus unable to respond to criticism from the narrator or from people who observed the war on the ground, where they could be seen or could see the trees, but not necessarily forest. Okay. Among the disgruntled veterans featured so prominently by Burns and Novick, a favorite complaint is the fighting of battles for terrain that gets abandoned after the American gained control of it. The veteran of a fierce hill fight says, to take the tops of mountains in the triple canopy jungle along the Cambodian Laotian border accomplished nothing of any importance. Fighting for remote mountains made sense, though, if one took into account the constraints that the U.S. political leadership imposed upon the war. President Lyndon Johnson prohibited his generals from conducting ground operations in Cambodia, Laos, and North Vietnam based on primarily on fears of Chinese intervention in the conflict. And it had been said by uh, Lyndon Johnson that no bomb was ever dropped or any village was ever attacked without his prior approval. Uh, kind of like um, micromanagement there, huh? Uh, given this prohibition, the United States had to choose between fighting for the remote hills or waiting for the North Vietnamese to move into the populous regions closer to the coast. What they were trying, what they're saying here is, uh, Devecchio is saying that. Basically, it was better to fight them on the mountains than fight them in the villages where you lost a lot of civilians and so forth. Experience showed that when the North Vietnamese came near the population, the presence of civilians greatly impeded the use of American air power and artillery to such an extent that defeating the North Vietnamese was at least as costly as defeating them in remote areas. I know it was frustrating to uh, win a hill and then turn around and take it back uh, for the guys, but... Uh, there was some uh, uh, reasoning along, along that lines. The fears that drove Johnson to confirm, confine the ground war to South Vietnam proved to be misplaced, according to what we have since learned about the Chinese foreign policy and North Vietnamese strategy. The Chinese, it turns out, were not willing to intervene in North Vietnam or Laos as they had done in North Korea in 1950. General Vo Nguyen Yip Reporters said that if the United States had conducted Operation Laos in North Vietnam, it could, it could have stymied Hanoi's war effort with 250,000 troops. Less than half of what the United States ultimately deployed. Now, let me go back and explain that to uh, those of you who didn't get that. Uh, the uh, North Vietnamese general who was in charge of uh, the war said that uh, had we gone into uh, Laos and North Vietnam with our troops, we could have won the war and, and with half the troops that we ended up sending and then walked away. It's one of several instances where poor decisions by U.S. political leaders squandered opportunities to preserve South Vietnam as an acceptable cost. Other areas include the overthrow of Diem in 1963 and the breaking of promises to support and protect South Vietnam after 1972. The war's outcome was not inedible results of superior North Vietnamese dedication or American arrogance, as Burns and Novak would have us believe, but errant U.S. strategy choices, and in the last case, the anti-war sentiments of American members of Congress. In previous shows, we have talked a little bit about the rules of engagement, uh, which would fit into that uh, category also. Veterans also objected to the production's favorable depiction of anti-war activists. Burns and Novick lead the audience to believe that the men who stayed home and protested against the war were as well-intentioned as those who served in Vietnam and were actually supporting the better cause. Now, I believe if you go back and check in history, after they changed from the draft to the lottery, war protesting dropped off because were those people protesting the war because they felt the war was wrong or they were protesting the war because they didn't want their butt to go to Vietnam. I didn't want to go either. But it's a proven fact that once they went to the uh, get away with the draft and went to the lottery uh, system, that a lot of war protesters uh, suddenly found other things to do. Their opposition is presented as principal revulsion of the war, untainted by selfish desire to avoid the danger of military service. Veteran Charles Cron, writing about the ninth episode as a guest contributor on Tom Rick's best defense blog, lamented that the episode favors those who oppose the war more than those who fought it. Soldiers' sacrifices seem trivialized 
compared to the energy and idealism of the demonstrators. Burns and Novick gave inordinate weight to the words of anti-war veterans, with at least one-third of those appearing on screen having expressed anti-war views or supported anti-war causes prior to filming. Few of the series' other veterans expressed support for the war, at least not in the interview segments that were aired. Even though supporters far outnumbered opponents among the general population of Vietnamese veterans, Vietnam veterans, this distortion rankled the veterans with whom Roberta, uh, reporter Tatania Sanchez interviewed for an American News article. Uh, I'm going to just keep going. Uh, a lot of us have, have a tremendous sense of pride for what we attempt to do and defend, said veteran Jim Barker one of New York Sun's website. Veteran and author Phil Jennings uh, berates Burns for failing to include the huge number of veterans who wholly supported the war, were proud to have appeared in arms and sickened by the United States abandonment as freedom and seek, freedom-seeking ally. Many of the anti-war uh, interviewees, uh, let me back up just a minute. Uh, one of the, just there when, when we were all on the slide there, um, I won't say, I'm not going to come right out and say they were biased, but one of the, uh, Burns' best friends was a guy who uh, was one of the original starters of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Uh, and to say that this person had not um, influenced uh, his friend Burns over the years in doing this project is, uh, uh, well, we just let you come up with your own on that. Many of the anti-war interviews expressed a disillusionment not only within the American cause in Vietnam, but also with the United States more generally. Several state that the Vietnam War convinced them that the concept of American exceptionality was a fallacy. This theme is a particular sore point among veterans who believe that they fought in a worthy war for a worthy country. During a panel discussion on the PBS series at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Vietnam veterans and historian Lewis, Lewis Sorley said that Burns was profoundly wrong for referring despairingly to what he called America's puffed-up sense of exceptionalism. Sorley added, clearly, Bun Burns does not think much or like America. Though Burns and Novick resisted putting historians on screen, they did make use of historical advers advisory panel consisting almost entirely of scholars on the left. The advisory panel makes its influence felt throughout the production, particularly in those parts read by narrator Peter Coyote, himself an anti-war activist. Reviewers for NPR, NBC, and the Washington Post who lavished praise on Burns and Novick for their even handedness ignored the panel's lack of balance. One suspects that they would have taken a different view of a suppo supposedly neutral 18-hour documentary on abortion that relied almost entirely on historians who considered abortion morally repugnant. One veteran on the advisory panel, James Wilbanks, submitted his resignation to Burns several years ago after seeing a preliminary version of the script that merely rehashed the anti-war movement's narrative. Promising to take his concerns into account, Burns convinced Wilbanks to stay on. To his credit, Burns included intermittent Statements from Will Banks that provide valuable correctness to the production's content and tone. Will Banks is seen disputing the notion that the Tiger Force atrocities were in any way representative of the conduct of U.S. forces in Vietnam. In the episode covering the 1972 Eastern Offensive, Will Banks says that the South Vietnamese ground forces, not just U.S. air, air power, were central to the defeat of North Vietnamese. Unfortunately, these momentary expressions of views prevalent in the Vietnam community are overwhelmed by countervailing uh, counter testimony and imagery. The filmmaker's bias is most evident when, it, when what is omitted. The documentary stresses the common success in marshalling Vietnamese civilians to move supplies and equipment during the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954 but makes no mention of the massive logistical support provided to, by the Chinese, including 1,000 trucks and tens of thousands of troops. This admission fools viewers into believing that the Vietnamese communists were self-reliant, in contrast with anti-communists who are depicted as puppets and dependents of the United States. 
narrator Coyote tells us that the international consensus held that Ho Chi Minh would have won a national election had it been held in 1956, as called for in the 1954 Geneva Accords. We'll get into the 1954 Geneva Accords in a little bit. South Vietnamese President Dem Dem's refusal to participate in such elections therefore appears to have been abrogation of the will of the Vietnamese people. What goes unsaid is that the South Vietnamese and American observers believe that Ho would have intimidated the North Vietnamese population into voting for him, which have been guaranteed his victory because the North was more populous than the South. In a subsequent segment, Burns and Novak criticized the Dem government for manipulating elections and winning 90% of the vote. But they are cited on the North's equally flagrant election rigging. The document accuses Dem of sending troops to round up Buddhists at the Pagodas on August 1963 after he had promised to avoid repressive measures. His heavily handed duplicity, it seems, precipitated the military coup that took his life. What's missing here is the crucial fact that Dem authorized these raids at the urging of the same generals who later overthrew him. The generals turned against Dem because Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge an American press corps led by David Habersham and Neil Sheehan badly misread the situation and promoted a coup. The film also neglects to mention that the Buddhist protest persisted, uh, protest persisted long after uh, Diem's death, convincing even their initial American supporters that the militant Buddhists were communists. Poems, rather than selfish, selfless companions of religion and liberty as American reporters uh, originally portrayed them. So that was the part that the uh, press had uh, uh, played in it that, that they don't like to talk about. The episode on 1966 includes clips of a congressional hearing in which diplomat George Keenan, founder of the American Containment Strategy, expressed doubts about the war's value in containing communism. We would do better, Keenan says, if we would really would show ourselves a little more relaxed and less terrified of what happens in certain of the smaller countries of Asia and Africa and not jump around like an elephant frightened by a mouse every time these things occur. Keenan in the film implies viewed the war as hopeless and saw withdrawal as the only viable choice. Most of the film's heroes, in fact, allegedly recognized early on the American effort was doomed, reinforcing the era of the aura of inevitability that hangs over the part production. In truth, Keenan like many others, were not adamant opposed to the war, not so confident of, its, confident of its outcome. In sections of his testimony that the film does not show, senators, senators pressed Keenan to explain how the United States could extricate itself from the Vietnam without doing great damage to American interest. Keenan acknowledges that he did not favor immediate withdrawal because it would facilitate communist expansion in, in neighboring countries and endanger world peace which is kind of uh, opposite of what they uh, said he was saying. Uh, he advocates a negotiated settlement that would allow U.S. to withdraw without giving the appearance of selling out an ally. 919-518-9773 or Computers 2K Voice. In the most telling exchange, Democratic Senator Frank Lash, Lachey of Ohio confronts, confronts Keenan on the question of how negotiation would produce the desired outcome. Have not the United States government and the people of the United States, as Lachey, probed every avenue through which there could be discussion towards reaching a settlement? Have, has there not been constant rebuttal of those efforts by China and by Hanoi? Keenan, it is correct that we have gotten nowhere. When Lachey asks what the Johnson administration should do, Keenan says, I would propose that we limit our aims and our military commitment in this area, that we decide that what we can safely hold in that region with due regard to the security of our forces, that we dig in and wait to see whether the possibilities for a solution do not open up. There are many, many people who believe this is exactly what our nation is trying to do, Lachey responded. Burns and Novak further misled through selective use of tape recordings of the Nixon administration. Those who hear only the exception excerpts presented, presented here will conclude that for reasons of political self-interest, 
Richard Nixon and Hinden Kissinger were planning to stand by the South Vietnamese until 1972 election and then cut them loose soon out thereafter. Historian Luke Nighter, a leading authority on the Nixon tapes, has faulted Burns and Nimick for exert, uh, exerting. Carefully chosen segments of the tapes to fit a preconceived notion of, or a larger point sometimes taken out of context while not giving evidence to the contrary a similar degree of attention. As Nighter notes, Nixon often expressed multiple positions as he pondered an issue. Many of his words and deeds on the issues of South Vietnam suggested a commitment to the long-term survival of the Saigon government. In other words, he argued with himself both sides of the uh, government too, before he came up with a decision. The documentary devotes five minutes to the story of Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese girl Kim Phuc, photographed moments after an errant South Vietnamese napalm strike burned her skin during the 1972 Easter offensive. We've all seen the picture of the young lady running down naked, running down the uh, road. Uh, one of the war's iconic images. At the end of the segment, Coyote says that Kim Phuc eventually left Vietnam and settled outside Toronto. He does not mention that she fled Vietnam seeking and obtaining asylum from its repressive communist regime. A larger historical transgression is the film's omission of the deliberate killing of civilians by the North Vietnamese during the same offensive. As South Vietnamese civilians fled south from Quang Tri for fear of a massacre like that inflicted by the communists at Way in 1968, North Vietnamese troops opened artillery fire on their slow-moving columns. Thousands of civilians were killed or wounded in these attacks. Likewise, absent is any mention of the South Vietnamese civilians killed during the 1975 offensive, the estimated 65,000 South Vietnamese killed shortly after the war ended and the tens of thousands who died in re-education camps. Kind of selective memory. Burns and Novick repeatedly depict the South Vietnamese military and government as less committed to their cause than the North Vietnamese counterparts. Several interviewees invoked this alleged inferiority to argue that we supported the wrong side, evidently without concern that the other side was fighting for the pernicious ideology of communism. As history has demonstrated repeatedly, commitment to a cause alone does not confer virtue. The Germans were more dedicated than the Poles in 1939 and the French in 1940. But no American would say that the United States should have sided with Nazi Germany. At one point, Coyote notes that 250,000 South Vietnamese troops were killed in the war. But we've never told why so many South Vietnamese are willing to die for a government as corrupt and unpopular as the documents suggest. Why were they there? if it was so bad. Whereas Burns and Novick explore the ideology of Ho Chi Minh at length, they ignore the nationalism and anti-communism that motivated so many of South Vietnam's leaders to fight to the death for the government. This disinterest in the South Vietnamese cause has galled South Vietnamese veterans as well as Americans that fought alongside them. I know South Vietnamese uh, military uh, who, after Saigon fell, they continued fighting until they ran out of food, water, and ammunition that the United States had promised them. We Vietnamese have a crystal clear understanding of the reasons why we fought. Nguyen Van Thai and Nguyen Hook Lin wrote in a blistering critique of the PBS series, we fought because we understood the cruelty and dictatorship of the communists. We fought because we did not wish the communists to impose a barbarous and inhuman regime upon us. More than one million people from North Vietnam fled their native land and immigrated to the South in 1954 in order to escape totalitarianism, which is ample evidence at this point. The second ep ep exodus of the 70s and 80s and early 90s also corroborated this, uh, corroborated this fact. The, the series disregards the Viet Cong's massive loss of support in the war's later years. In 1967, communist recruitment in of South Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese youth began plummeting and it never recovered. As the war turned increasingly against Hanoi, an estimated 200,000 of those supposedly zealous communist troops defected to the South uh, Vietnam. Uh, a lot of them became uh, Chi Hoi program and became Kit Carson scouts who uh, worked for the South. While no history of the Vietnam War can fully satisfy everyone, Burns and Novick could have achieved something closer to the impartial account they promised. 
presenting facts and stories within their proper context and including contrasting examples that supported the, com the competing schools of thought on the war. They could have refrained from taking sides on controversies like the invalidity of the domino theory, the moral rectitude of the South Vietnamese government, and the merits of American exceptionalism. They could have sought advice from more than a handful of people who did not share their contempt for the war. For Evans, what might have been one needed to look no further than the Vietnam War exhibit that opened early this month at the New York Historical Society. As someone who served on the exhibit's advisory panel alongside many people with this diametrically opposed viewpoints, I can attest that great effort went into ensuring the exhibit's even handedness. Those dissatisfied with the pol polemical nature of the PBS series will find this treatment refreshing and fair minded alternative. Mark Morey is the director of the CSIS project on military diplomatic history. Uh, also uh, wrote a book, uh, Triumph Forsaken, the Vietnam War, 1954-65. Okay, 919-518-973, Skype. It's your voice. Your voice matters how the show goes. We have uh, run out of time uh, there, so I'm going to stop it right there, and um, we're going to pick it back up again November 8th. That'll be our next show. And I hope you uh, call in. And in the meantime, email me at DixonBill80 at yahoo.com and give me your opinions or whatever uh, you'd like to do uh, about what we've covered tonight. And hopefully I have proven that uh, Brenzinovic's uh, documentary uh, should not be the standing historical reference that uh, it, that I feel that it's going to be for schools to study and so forth. Uh, thank you for tuning in and looking forward to seeing you again, as I said, November 8th. And we'll be just before uh, support uh, celebrating uh, Veterans Day. So if you're out tomorrow about uh, and you see a veteran, go tell them, shake their hand and tell them thank you for the service. You see a, a Vietnam veteran, just go and, uh, that another Vietnam veteran said, welcome home and tune into the show next time. Thank you and good night. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net. <laughs>